You are listening to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. Great Welcome stuff. to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Hampton. My unusually well-informed guests today are Thomas Hubbock and Nick Van Langendonk. Nick is the founder of Highfluence, a, comp- a consulting firm that helps organizations rethink the way they are structured, deliberate the talents and innovation they need to succeed in a complex world. Nick is also a guest lecturer at the University of Antwerp and a- Antwerp Management School. Before joining Highfluence as a partner, Thomas was the CEO of Belgium's leading sugar producer, Sucre Tillemont, a company with over 1,000 people. Together, Thomas and Nick host the Unbossing podcast. Today, Thomas, Nick, and I are discussing the ways large organizations can become and remain nimble. Thomas and Nick, welcome to the show. Well, Thank you so much, Tim. It's my pleasure. to be here. So Highfluence helps organizations unboss. How does unbossing work and what are the advantages? Thomas, you go first. Yeah, look, Tim, what I love to use is the picture of the huge oil tanker on on one side. And this huge oil tanker is for me the typical large traditional company. An automobile manufacturer, a pharmaceutical company, an insurance company existing since 150 years. That is for me the huge oil tanker. And to get the oil tanker to the other side of the river, because at the other side of the river is a fleet, a fleet of 50 or 100 speedboats. And in these 100 speedboats are sitting exactly the same people than they were sitting in the huge oil tanker. And this picture is still for me, other people may have other pictures which they prefer, pyramids which are turned upside down, also not bad. But I love this picture of the huge oil tanker and converting the huge oil tanker into a fleet of speedboats. And if you like, I could elaborate much more on the differences between the huge oil tanker and the fleet of speedboats, and also on the reasons why the huge oil tanker, which worked so well over so many decades, is not working anymore. And the fleet of speedboats is the way to go. But I will give the word to Nick now. Okay. Nick, over to you. Um, I'll, 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 I'll build on the, the example of Thomas and make it more concrete. Um, so every organization, every group of people that works towards a common goal, they work together based on rules and regulations, right? Um, whether or not people have their computer open during a meeting mm-hmm. is a written or unwritten rule and regulation of the company. Whether you are evaluated once a year or every quarter is a rule uh, or a regulation which uh, exists in the company. Now, the bureaucratic organization, the, the, the oil tanker that Thomas mentions, functions today on an enormous, huge amount of rules and regulations, both written and unwritten, which have evolved over time. And when I say evolved over time, really since the beginning of, 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 of human beings, right? The first big organizations. And so for a long time, obviously, the rules and regulations of Mr. Frederick Taylor dominated how we look at organizations. And Dom- Fr- Frederick Taylor was a brilliant man for his time. Uh, he was the first to apply scientific um, a scientific perspective to how organizations function. Now, if you would apply that same scientific perspective on organizations today, and you look at the ro- rules and reg- regulations that we use for op- organizations to operate on, the software they use to operate on, we will see that it is no longer fit for the world we live in today. And so in essence, to me, in order to get from the oil tanker to the 50 speedboats, you have to radically simplify, first eliminate a lot of rules and regulations that no longer support the way we have to do things today. And then 
come up with new alternatives, which are better suited for how people look at work today, how people look at their lives today, and how businesses look at their customers, products, and services. Great. That's a, so. Uh, in, go ahead, Nick. Embossing in one word for me is simply. Yeah. So in, in, in one sentence, it's simply software. That's to me unbossing. Okay. Um, I'll, I'd like to return to the speedboat metaphor later on. There are, there are metaphors that we apply to life um, that obviously are only models of real life. And so it's easy to say, oh, but this, oh, but that, and it doesn't apply in real life. Um, but I, I, one of the things uh, about one of the arguments could be, well, you would never transport oil from one country to another in a thousand speedboats. Right. There are advantages to a large organization and there are also advantages to individuals having more agency than typically do in a large organization. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you take advantage of the 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 strength of a large organization when you have people uh, operating so independently, Thomas? This is an absolute wonderful question. And. What you are saying is, and sorry that I keep uh, with the speedboats because I love it so much, but then I leave it again. What you are saying is, how the hell do you make sure that these speedboats don't go all over the place? And how do you even make sure that such a fleet of 50 speedboats is still a fleet, is still a company, and is still one large team? And for me, there is only one answer, and it's, it's, it's purpose. It's purpose. It's vision. It's where do you all want to be in a couple of years, maybe in one year. And Tim, as long as this is not clear, crystal clear to everybody on, every, on these speedboats, forget about unbossing. Don't mm-hmm. even start with it. And it's a very, very relevant uh, point. And it's also a point where yeah, Nick and I have, have our experiences with. Uh, because you can have the nicest unbossing experiences. You can have wonderful uh, concepts going through. If this purpose thing is not clear, mm-hmm. then you will very soon, very soon, uh, stumble on this roadblock and you cannot go any further. So it's for me the only way to keep these speedboats as a team. Yeah. So I'd like to tackle also, the... Yeah. Tim, go, ahead, go ahead, Nick. Uh, you can also tackle uh, again building on what Tom, you'll notice during the entire conversation we, Thomas and I, we build on each other's uh, 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 the passes that we give. In the unbossing um, style. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you could also... Um, tackle your question in a, from a different perspective. So when you say the oil, the goal of the oil tanker is to bring oil from A to Z or from A to B, um, the main question is how do you do that as efficiently as possible? Mm-hmm. Which was basically the problem that organizations 100 years ago had to solve. How can we produce en masse as efficient as possible? And if you, lead, if you, for example, read the book Scientific Management from uh, Frederick Taylor, you see he focuses like he was an engineer. He focuses like hell on efficiency. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem organizations today have is not really how can we be as efficient as possible at scale. The problem that most corporates today is how can we be as creative, as inclusive, as innovative at scale. And so where the oil tanker might be the best means to bring oil from A to B as efficient as possible, it is no longer the best means of transport if you want to do it in the most creative, innovative, and inclusive way. And so it's not whether the oil tanker or the the fleet of speedboats is better. It just serves or tackles a different problem. And the problem of today is how can we create creativity and innovation at scale in all layers of the organization? 
Right. And if you'll forgive me for straining the analogy further, a, an oil tanker is great if you're absolutely certain you want to go from A to B with all of that oil. But if you want to go to C, D, E, F, and maybe F changes its mind and now it's G, you can't do that with a tanker. You need, a, you need to break it up a little bit. And, and, and that's it, Tim. Thank you very much. But that is also the reason why the oil tanker used to function so well. Yeah, because the markets were stable. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, look, Tim, if, if I was a, a bank uh, five or 10 years ago, innovation was for me a new type of checking account <laughs> with, a, with, with a new color. That yes. was innovation. If I was Daimler-Benz a couple of years ago, innovation was for me the new Mercedes S-Class with even better features, mm. with even more color options. And now imagine we even have airbags. Wow, that was innovation. Yeah. I can go on to the new printing machine. We have the new model of our printing machine, Tim. We are innovative like hell. Now, what we all agree upon, Tim, is what, Tim, is what I'm talking about, is incremental, so-called innovation. And in other words, these markets were so stable, nothing was happening. Also, no disruption was happening from left and to the right, that I could nicely sit there and optimize all that thing for efficiency. You know, squeeze out another penny here, being, that's what I think then, being innovative in, in, in finding an even, an even better way to save uh, a couple of minutes in, in, in production time. But as we also, as we both know, if I'm now in automobile, if I'm now in banking, if I'm now in podcasting, Nick, I don't, the markets are not stable. Mm -hmm. And they will not become stable as they used to be. So forget about uh, optimizing that whole thing on 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 being uh, extremely uh, on on on, a, on effect on efficiency yeah but you have to go for creativity you have to go for what you call nimbleness i like that also very much and also and that is the, the biggest elephant in the room and that is what most companies uh, drives to us is you have to have talent you have to have talented people who are willing to go with you together. Right. And these talented people, uh, Tim, even if you have the biggest, best branded oil tanker in the world, they will not come to you anymore. So. Yeah. Well, I'd like to can I add one. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Nick, please. Well, I just want to add, um, I don't want listeners now to think I have to change my organization because the world is changing. Um, obviously, the external changes are definitely um, triggers to change. But if you yourself do not believe that there's simply no other alternative than completely changing how your corporate organization function, in other words, if you only do it, if you only start changing your organization because of the potential outcomes you'd like to have, more employ engaged employees, faster service to your customers, then, well, the, the how does, chances of success become a little bit lower. You know, most successful unbossed leaders that have really flipped their organization, yes, they gained all the results and outcomes that we are now discussing. They became more creative, innovative, and so on. But in... In essence, they just started the change because they simply didn't see any other alternative than leading their organization in an unbossed way. Okay, so there's, there's so many exciting threads I want to pull on. Let me start with you talking about cars and, and car production and Frederick Taylor. Um, Taylorism, in my interpretation, I sort of see a, a, an evolution over time. So we have Taylorism, which is an expert is going to watch you build a car and tell you how to build a car more efficiently. We're dividing thought and labor. And yes. then you have the lean uh, innovations from Toyota, which reintegrate that say that the worker on the line can alert 
uh, us to problems and think of solutions to problems they see on the line, we can continuously improve the product on the line. I think we're seeing a new evolution, which is the Tesla way. And it comes with a price, but there, there are, they are at different ends of the spectrum in that Toyota will design a car with an effort to make it a perfect design and then begin building it and then improve the production. Tesla will begin building a car and then work on the design of the car daily, modifying the design. Now, it's not no surprise, therefore, that Toyota is doing the incremental improvements that Thomas is talking about. We'll slowly bring electrical power into the car with a hybrid, but we're not necessarily going to go all the way to EV. Tesla is like right out of the gate going EV. But we see headlines all the time about panel gaps and poor build quality and bugs in Teslas. Is that the price of innovation? Are, are they going too far or is that the way of the future or does it depend on the situation? I'll, I'll start with Nick because he started with the, with the Taylorism. So... Is your question that the price for innovation comes with uh, lower quality? Is that what is that the question you're asking me, Tim? Well, I guess the the I'm starting with the premise that we used to experiment within the organization until we were confident that it would work, and then we would release it. That was the way physical goods were sold, and for the last mm -hmm. 20 years. Digital goods have been sold knowing that there's going to be a patch, there's going to be a flaw, there's going to be an update. Mm -hmm. And Tesla is taking that software approach and applying mm -hmm. it to, to physical goods. Is that a healthy thing? I personally see it as being responsible for why Tesla is able to have such innovative products. But the problem is, as a consumer, I could be buying one of the ones that doesn't come out of the factory right. Well, I, I think it's um, behind it, there's a different perspective on how do we look at problems and challenges and how do we try to solve those, right? If you look for, to problem and, 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 and challenges from the efficiency perspective, the idea is you keep building until there are no problems and challenges anymore with the product, and then you start shipping it. Um, and that's also based on the idea that there's one person who can validate whether the product or service, um, well, is, 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 you know, the quality is, is perfect and it's okay to ship out. Um, first and foremost, you can already ask yourself the question whether you can generate enough speed um, if you continue to work as such, if you make the control equality dependent of one person saying, okay, it's okay to go out. But more importantly, um, I think companies like Tesla, they do not see the problems that they have with their products as real problems. They see them as opportunities to improve the products. And they you could say the customer suffers or you could turn around and say, no, the customer jointly co-creates a better and improved product. So it's not whether the product ha still has problems. It's how do you go about that then? How do you communicate to your customers so that they kind of have the feeling um, that they accept the errors and that they have the feeling that they can impact uh, the product as such. And I think if you take Tesla as an example, I don't know a lot of Tesla drivers who aren't proud, you know, they're, they're even proud. Like, Hey, there was, I, I detected the problem with my car and there was a software update and now it's fixed. So I think behind it, there's a different perspective on is a problem really something bad or is it something good? And secondly, is it okay to uh, integrate your customers in the process of improving your product? Well said. Thomas, do you want to ask one? And, and you know, on what that reminds me, uh, Tim and Nick, and now, of course, I'm looking at Nick. The famous CEOs or famous executive teams who are, for example, telling us, look, guys, if we come out with a new organizational model in our, and I mean now internally towards our people, it has to be perfect. We have to be able to answer every question which comes, which is being thrown at us. Mm -hmm. 
So we have to perfect this model before we even think of communicating now a new agile model, a new unbossed model, because the biggest embarrassment for us as executive team would be, God forbid, that we couldn't answer a question from mm -hmm. our people, that we couldn't know how this will turn out in half a year or in 12 months. Tim, you understand where I'm getting to? It's, yes. it's exactly the same mindset, like a bank who says, or an insurance company or whatever, who says, is the product finished? Is this new um, uh, pilot, which we are working on now since two and a half years, and which our competitors, by the way, uh, from Amsterdam and Berlin have already on the market for two years, is it now finished? No, Tim, it's not yet finished. <laughs> First, the legal department has not finally signed off on it. There yeah. is also still sign off for marketing and we have so many details and it's not perfect. We are not ready. So the sentence you, which you is are... often used is, uh, uh, in unbossed organizations is good enough for now and safe enough to try, right? Right. Well, so not, well, not, st not striving for perfection, but good enough for now and safe enough to try. Yeah, so we it's adopting some of... Some yeah. of the mindset of lean startup. This yeah, idea I mean, that we yeah. need to put it in customers' hands. When we think of rules and regulations that come as an alternative of eliminating many of, of the typical bureaucratical rules and regulations, which are mainly control based, um, obviously you look back in time and you say, okay, but what did work well? And mm -hmm. there are definitely some rules and regulations linked to lean and agile thinking, which clearly work well. The problem is that a lot of corporates introduce those rules as well in their organization, but they don't first eliminate all right. the rules and regulations that are kind of contraproductive. So you could say, yeah, I want my teams to work closer to customers and in short iterations and in co-creation with customers. So some agile rules and principles. But if you remain having the rule, for example, that only the sales department can talk with your customers or that you still have to have a fixed uh, budgeting process. Mm -hmm. So rules that actually contraproduct uh, are, are working against the new rules of agile and lean that you're trying to introduce, you get in this gray, very confusing area where a lot of corporates currently are they've launched agile projects oh it doesn't work no because the rules of the bureaucratic organization are also still there and so eliminating first all those rules or many of them uh, is a, a super crucial step which is unfortunately often forgotten yeah nick and even that doesn't work if first the mindset doesn't change as long as failure is something deeply to be deeply embarrassed about. Yeah. As long as, as that is the highest rule. And I can tell you off the spot, many corporations which are still governed by that mindset, mm -hmm. as long as that doesn't change, Tim, it's, it's a lost case. So I want to return to, I, I think it was Nick who was talking about um, uh, well, I'm, I'm interpreting what you said, but th that you don't want to uh, instantly switch over to unbossing, that there's a transition phase, an experimentation, even when it comes to how one experiments, that the organization has to get accustomed to it. That's, uh, forgive me, I'm interpreting a bit, but I want to pick oh, up on, you're right. on, on that with, with a counterexample. I believe that unbossing um, is a if you'll forgive the, the phrase generic, but it's a generic, it's a, it's a, a, a uh, overview of processes that include holacracy. Is that a fair description? Do you include holacracy as a way, uh, as one of the ways to approach unbossing? Holacracy is definitely a system that can support an unbossed way of working. Yeah. And yeah. one of the famous examples of holacracy is Zappos. And there are there are some some uh, interesting uh, stories that flow from Zappos and their adoption of holacracy. The punchline is that, according to some reports, they're actually backing away from using it. That's mm -hmm. one thing that we'd, I'd like to get your reaction to. But also, the way it was implemented is not what you were saying about a gradual transition. It was more like a Stalinist purge. They said, if you're I, if you're going to be part of this holacracy. You can stay. If you're not, we're just going to buy you out. And 18% of the company left. 
-hmm. So can I get your reactions to uh, what went wrong there and what, what Highfluence's approach is to this transition to make it so that people get on board easier? First, the main thing I want listeners to take away from the Zappos process is not the actual result. We don't live in a world. I mean, Zappos is a company of 1,800 people uh, making 1,800 people working together uh, in the complex world. There, are, there is no holy grail. There's no perfect solution. And so the, an often made mistake is that people focus on the result while their process is what really counts, right? The fact that they questioned the bureaucratic way of working, that they then thought, ah, let's install holacracy. And then they learned from that and they learned what works well and what doesn't work well, and they adapted again. Mm -hmm. That is, instead of looking at the result, it's far more interesting to look at what type of questions are they asking themselves. How And the main questions they're asking is they believe their way they work together, their organization model, could be a competitive example advantage towards other competitors in the market. And they ask themselves questions. Spotify did the same thing. and But often we look at the Spotify model, the higher model, the, the Zappos model. But the end result is not important because if you ask yourself exactly the same questions, you will end up somewhere differently because you, every company is unique, right? So it's the questions that they ask themselves. That's the first thing I want to say. Second thing about Holacracy, it's a great tool, but a fool with a tool is still a fool. So really ramping down holacracy, the system in the organization without first having a lot of dialogue to really understand the mindset and the philosophy behind it is, um, yeah, is a very dangerous approach. And I, I think that's what we can learn from Zappos, that uh, it is a fantastic system. It is a fantastic tool, let's say. Um, but if the people don't have the mindset behind it, um, yeah, many things can go wrong. Thomas, Lastly, do you want to I add do, to that? I, oh, I, go ahead. I do, I, 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 I do like the fact that they said you're either in or out because that's often, isn't that often in many corporate organizations, um, well, a problem like that the company culture is so gray that no, anyone fits in and no one fits in and anyone can complain, but there's no, you know, so the fact that he said, this is a non-negotiable, you're either in or out, that's creating clarity. And a lot of unbossing is creating clarity in organizations, which are today for many people confusing, right? So, so the fact Nick, that let me, let me yeah. pick up on that before I go to Thomas. This is, one of the things I struggle with, because it, it is an apparent contradiction, that it takes a boss to make an unbossed organization, that it takes somebody with the, with the authority to say, no, this is how we're doing it uh, in order for it to happen. How mm -hmm. do you address that? Because one of, the, one of the challenges and one of the things I think Thomas raised is it, it, everybody needs to be organized around a mission. But how is that mission set and altered over time? If if it does it have to be somebody at the very top of a very flat, but like there's still a ruler and then everything else is flat? Or how do you address that? Oh, there's so <sighs> many ways to to dive into that question, you know, because you 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 uh, touch upon how do you come to a mission which is co-created with a lot of people in the organization, and then how do you who takes then the decision to finally go into a system like holacracy? Um, Let's start with the word ruler, because <laughs> that triggers me. Mm -hmm. There is still a ruler. No. The, uh, it, it really, oh, Tim, this is, there are so many ways to answer your question. Um, you could say the last decision that the CEO takes is the decision that he will no longer take any decisions. 
Mm -hmm. so. that's that's his to that's his or her to make you know there's no one else who can make that decision he had in if to move away from the bureaucratic organization as we call it to an unbossed organization the ceo has to decide guys i want to take as minimal as uh, um, decisions um as 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 needed and i want to really give power decentralized power to the teams which are closest to the customer mm -hmm. I think what you can learn from Zappos is, or in our experiences, that is that, and I really want the listeners to know, if you look at a time period of three years in a typical company of a couple of thousand people, about 70 to 80% will eventually adapt the change. So even though in the beginning there might be more resistance, especially if you make some typical communication mistakes, we have to know that research shows and the adoption of innovation, adoption of innovation, that in the end, 70 to 80 percent of the group will adopt the change. And therefore, I would have waited until two years, three years in the journey and then see who are the really ter therapy resistant people. So the people that doesn't matter how much you invest in them. It doesn't matter how many trainings you give them. It doesn't matter how you involve them in different projects. They will keep resisting this, this change. Mm -hmm. And with those people, you have to have a conversation. But a lot of the resistance you feel in the beginning is actually not resistance to your change. It's just people who are not understanding it yet. Um, they, they may be afraid they will not be able to follow. They will not be good enough. So everybody needs their own rhythm and speed to be able to adopt this change. But if you look in a journey again of two, three years, eventually 80% of your organization will adopt and will no longer want to go back to the old way of working. So I think from Zappos, that's what you can take away is rather than saying at the beginning, you're out, you're in or out, maybe go on a journey with everybody for two years and then start looking at who are the really therapeutic resistant people as we call them, right, Thomas? Absolutely. So can we start with the misconceptions? Please. Unbossing means there are no leaders anymore. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, is that wrong? How wrong is that? Amazon, Spotify, Tesla. Nobody ever would describe these companies as being without leadership, right? Nobody ever would come on this idea. Then the picture of the CEO, Tim, sitting back now, very relaxed with a cup of tea and said, hey, guys, I told you yesterday, no decisions anymore. No bossing around. I'm just watching you guys. I have my tea cup in my hand and I enjoy the wonderful atmosphere over here while doing my yoga as well. It's total nonsense. There is more leadership than ever needed, but not what I call the intellectual leadership of a corporate CEO, not the leadership which locks himself or herself in with a closed circle of advisors and, and, and creates a genius PowerPoint presentation of 80 slides and presents that then at the analyst day and also internally and thinks the work is done. The work is just starting. And that is what 80% of corporate CEOs are simply not able to because they are simply not able to formulate a crystal clear vision and purpose statement which everybody, and I mean everybody, in the company, and also the janitor, and also the people at the reception desk, and also the truck drivers, understand and can live. And already there, 80% of yeah, so-called leaders, I call them bosses, uh, fail miserably because they are simply not used to that. So rulers and bosses, Tim, who tell you exactly what to do and how you have to do it yeah, and check on you every, every hour, Tim, if you also did it right, they are gone. Mm -hmm. That's a thing of the past. Leaders 
we even don't have enough of them. That is what I think. Well, so in terms of emotional leadership, Tim, Zappos is a fantastic example because he, he kind of eliminated a lot of rules and regulations of the bureaucratic way of working. And he said, customer wow, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't care what you do as long as there's a customer wow, which led to an incredible innovation in customer service. Um, and what I like to add as well, also tied back to your early question, like, is, do you always pay a price in quality because you go so fast and innovative? There are also examples, and I tie this to leadership that Thomas said, it's not only the leadership of the CEO that changes, but it's also the natural leaders in the organization which are developing the project and or the products. And they become leaders making sure that the product is not shipped if they are not proud enough anymore. It's not someone else telling, okay, now it's ready. You know, there's, there's the proud and that's also a form of leadership you want to um, uh, flourish in a non bossed organization is where the people take the lead to say, ah, this product is not good enough. We have to make it better, right? Because they're proud and passionate about the product. Let me pick up on a theme that Thomas raised, which is the flow of information within the organization. Um, mm -hmm. And let me, let me read a quote from Elon Musk, who uh, Thomas and I are both fans of. That's sort of how we bonded on LinkedIn and how, how we came to know each other. Exactly. Um, and thanks to Joe Justice, by the way. Exactly. Joe Justice, a previous uh, guest on the show, uh, did talk a lot about the, the flow of information at Tesla. Elon Musk uh, has a habit of sending company-wide emails occasionally, uh, trying to set the tone, trying to set the culture. And uh, there was an email that went out, I think it was in 2020. And if I may read a couple of paragraphs from it, there are two, this is quoting him, there are two schools of thought about how information should flow. By far the most common way is chain of command, which means you always flow information through your manager. The problem with that approach is that while it enhances the power of the manager, it fails to serve the company. To solve the problem quickly, two people in different departments should simply talk and make the right thing happen. Instead, people are forced to talk to their manager, who talks to their manager, who talks to the manager in the other department, who talks to someone on his team. Then the info has to flow back the other way again. This is incredibly dumb. Any manager who allows this to happen, let alone encourages it, will soon find themselves working at another company. Thomas, I can see this is resonating with you. Um, what is your reaction to Elon's com uh, comments from the perspective of unbossing? Thomas, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah. Look, Tim, this is, this is pure gold. And, and uh, I guess you see it in my facial uh, expression. <laughs> and uh, I, it's clear I, that I couldn't agree more on that it should be also clear let's not kid ourselves that 95 percent of all corporations and here i'm generous could be also 99 but i say 95 percent <laughs> of all corporations as we are sitting here are exactly working in this dumb way still which elon musk describes as dumb where I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, say it better. And now it gets even worse, um, Tim, because many managers have built their career in perfecting this political environment, have built their career on building an experience and mastership in a game which is bringing down which, which, which used to work for them and miraculously also for some companies in the past, but which is for sure bringing the companies down in the future. And that is, of course, something that we have to face uh, here when we say, guys, all your political skills, all, your, all what you think you have mastered now over the last 15 years and which proud you up to be now a proud member of the executive committee. 90% of that you have to unlearn. Just forget about it. Just see it as a folklore yeah, uh, from a time uh, which has to be long gone. And that is a huge, huge... Uh, roadblock which we are facing almost daily 
And now, before I give to Nick, because Nick, this fully, this information to be fully available I, to everybody, I heard it for the first time from our podcast guest, Thais Glass, who is the owner of the printing company Dedicate uh, in Belgium, yeah, Tim, where people at the printing machines are members of micro enterprises within this printing company. And everybody who is standing at the printing machine doing whatever has every single company information the same and with the same speed as the company owner, which is mm -hmm. Thais, has it. And with that, I would like to give the word to Nick, but I, I, I was immediately reminded of that. Thank you, Thomas. Nick? Well, I, I think it's time that corporate organizations uh, start adopting the fluidity of information and the easiness of access of information that exists today in the world. I mean, it's very funny that uh, when we leave our offices, we, we have access to different channels of information and, and we choose ourselves which information we want to digest and which not. And so this whole idea of trying to align people on all the bits and pieces of information that they get, um, I think is, 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 is tied indeed back to a, a world that doesn't exist anymore. So the, I, I like to think about it as uh, fluidity. How do you make information fluid? And knowing that most corporates, they have different generations in there. You know, my parents, they prefer to get their information through very clear emails, right, uh, from their suppliers. Whereas um, myself, I don't mind if they send me WhatsApp messages, you know. So it's in, in, in how do you support, well, it's basically adopting the flu flow of information which already exists outside the world into a corporate organization. And the prerequisite to do that is to let go of control mm -hmm. and, and to trust that people will digest the information that they need to digest and have a couple of key messages that you continuously repeat because those are the very simple, clear messages that you want them, that you want everybody to know. And for the rest, they have to be, yeah. Let me, let me explore a possible counterpoint to, to Elon's argument. Um, and that is that if everybody's talking to everybody, one of the things we know for sure is that information overflow, overload is a, is a problem for people at work. And one of the reactions to that is to divide up the workplace. Like we'll take the car example again. I have a, an, en an engine team and a transmission team, and they know exactly how they bolt together. And they don't need to ask each other anything because they know what that interface looks like. So they have a stable interface to work from. You can modularize the work. Bill Gates was big on this at Microsoft. He would set up uh, the company so that small teams could divide the work up and they could work in parallel. So I guess part of the dance that I'm, I'm sort of contemplating is that there, there are advantages to breaking into teams. But the, the, the risk is that you become fixed in that team because a lot of the, the, the most fruitful innovation can happen across those stable interfaces. When you, can, when you can rethink what that interface itself looks like, then you can change things quite a bit. Um, so how, I, I guess what I'm struggling with is in an unbossed organization, how can you create divisions so that work can be done in parallel and then, yeah. and then also allow those divisions to be rethought all the time. I'll start with I, Nick. I, I thought we were talking about how do you, um, how do you provide information? How do you create transparency of information in the organization? And based on your question, I now get the picture like uh, you link this to organization structure. Um, and I was completely focused on how information flows in an organization. Okay, let's start with that. And, and it, is, it, yeah, is so, so, it is so well. I don't. I don't really think so. So I mean, the organization structure of an unbossed organization is very simple, right? It's it's a modular approach to organization structure where you say, okay, what's the smallest entity within a company, and it's the team. It's there where <laughs> yeah, I love the research from Google Aristotle's project. 
It's in the operational team that IDs are generated, that products are uh, created, that interpersonal relationship uh, matters. And that's also where people experience their work, right? And so um, I truly believe that the, 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 the only alternative today to be successful is an organization structure of very independent teams, which are loosely tied together. That's organization structure, right? And the collaboration with other teams, in my opinion, should be voluntary because there's a win-win for both teams to work together. Um, on the other hand, how does then information flow through the organization? Well, there, I think the key word is just transparency. Whatever information there is should be available for anyone in an easy way. And it's the people themselves that decide they know the information is somewhere and it's them themselves which information they want to digest and which not with one exception. And those are the one, two, three, four, five key principles of the company that you want everybody to understand. And those you repeat, repeat, repeat. Thomas, did you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, Tim, when uh, listening to you and also thinking of it, um, I, I have to think of a, a certain famous automobile company where the CEO wrote a book about, it's already 20 years ago. And he was talking about the relationship between the research and development department or kingdom on one side and another kingdom, which was the production department in the same company, obviously, on the other side. And he was describing that the research and development kingdom developed a new car over years without that anybody in this company, and certainly not the production part, would ever know any details of this car. And then when the prototype of the research and development department was finished and standing at the entrance gate of the headquarter. And they presented it to everybody. That was the moment when the production people for the first time in their life saw this new car. And that is not a joke. This is a true story written by a CEO in a book. Mm -hmm. And I think that says so much about because when we when we talk about these silos, Tim, I'm what I'm seeing most is these functional silos. And when I I talk about uh, empowered teams and speedboats, then I certainly talk about teams where all these functions are sitting in it, right? And not as representatives of their tribe, but as people who take decisions. Now, when we talk about the modularity, um, what is a good idea and how to divide it, uh, Tim? <coughs> I have to look. Sorry, I have to look at Bosch, Bosch Power Tools, which has now, which is on the path to unbossing, and uh, they are quite uh, uh, advanced, I would say. And they, for example, have one micro enterprise for every single of their products. Mm. today uh, that is certainly a way to do it uh, I cannot speak now very much about the modules in, a, in an automobile uh, I think uh, what Tesla is doing uh, there is, 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 is quite good well Thomas uh, the, the, the story you told about the CEO of a car company reminds me of, of something that was blurted out at the Q4 uh, at report that Tesla did recently, uh, the conference call. I'm not sure who it was on the call. It was somebody, somebody high up at Tesla um, said that they see research and development and product development as the same bleeping thing. Yeah. Right? Uh, that, it, that, that it's not a waterfall process, that they're integrated. So that, yes. that really is a counterpoint to the example you raised. Yes. And we have to understand, even if that sounds to us fully normal and reasonable, 
it's a revolution in mm -hmm. the industry. To us, that sounds fully normal. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, why ever? But it wasn't done like that so far. So I'm going to ask some some uh, really low level questions just to get a, a to, for me and and for the people listening to get a sense of what an unbossed organization looks like. And I should also acknowledge that probably they don't all look the same. So I I understand that, but um, probably definitely definitely. So I guess my my first question is when you're working with a company, do you give any thought to how it's physically organized? In other words, do you say, okay, we should put everybody in an open area or we should hot desk or even how, how does the fact that some people are now working from home impact on bossing? Do you have any thoughts on how physically a company should organize? Well, the, the essence of unbossing is that whatever problem or challenge exists in the company, the best people to solve it is the people facing the problem or the challenge, mm -hmm. right? And so we would never go in and say, oh, you have to organize your office like this. You have to work uh, in an online way like that. We would say, okay, what is the problem here? What is blocking you guys from working together and creating more value? And if um, the office design comes up as a topic, <clears throat> we will facilitate them to go from a solution process where one person goes sit into a room, designs a new office and then say, this is it, like the mm -hmm. example of Thomas. And we will facilitate them to use the collective intelligence of the group to come up with the best possible idea without losing the speed of decision-making that you also get when just one person says, this is how it is. Right. So, And that's basically the philosophy we, we apply to everything, Tim. We are not the, the best people to solve it is the people who have to sit in that office. They know what they need best. Good. Okay. Thomas, do you want to add to that? There is something um, which very obviously changed in the last uh, well, yeah, 24 months. <laughs> and yes. uh, the, the, the first thing is, uh, Tim, a huge red flag is, from my point of view, is my opinion, this return to office urgency. When you feel and hear people and so-called leaders saying, oh my God, now, but now when it's possible, as soon as it's legally possible, I want to have my people back over here physically in my office. It's a huge red flag. And why is it like that? because it is out of a control uh, mechanism, very, very clearly, whatever they tell you. Yeah? And I'm talking about managers who say, I want them permanently back physically over mm -hmm. here. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah? Yeah. I'm not talking about managers who say, I want still the possibility of our people to meet and see each other physically. That's not what I'm, what I'm talking about. And the other thing which... Um, pops up in my head is a certain danger and a certain danger is the following that in the future we would have people who are sitting physically together and who regularly come would come to the office and another group of people who would rarely do that because i don't know they live five thousand kilometers away um uh, they are in canada under deep snow <laughs> And the danger would be not to create two types, two clubs of people. First, the insiders who are physically there uh, mm -hmm. are seeing each other almost on a daily basis physically. And then the others who somehow, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we also have to invite Tim to the meeting. Oh, yeah, Tim, of course, of course. Wait, I, I, I will invite him. Jesus. Yeah. So, and that are real dangers. And I think unbossing, and I don't know the, the opinion of Mick on that, but unbossing plays into it to say we have to create a level playing field for everybody in this company. No matter if this person is living half, half a kilometer away from headquarters or 10,000 kilometers uh, deeply deep in the Canadian forests. 
Yeah. Uh, Just for the record, I live very close to a city. (laughs) You you know what I'm talking about. So I find I find these elements very interesting um, because they are not directly influencing unbossing, but that are markers from my point. Nick, do you want to add to that? Well, I want to get back to what I my first definition. So if unbossing is the radical simplification of rules and regulations, the radical simplification of the software, the written and unwritten software that the company functions on, and then um, coming up with new rules and regulations that support the people in the organization to create more value and so on. I wouldn't say like Thomas that um, it's definitely like the Corona. What did Corona do? Most typical corporates and organizations had a control driven rule, which is you have to be in the workplace from nine to five, because that's how we can see that you're working. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, undoubtedly, the pandemic, whether you wanted it or not as a, as a CEO or a manager, uh, changed that rule. And the rule was you have to stay at home. Um, and now that the pandemic is hopefully coming to an end, um, some managers will want to go back to the original rule out of control. But I see a lot of managers who are actually in the process of unbossing, which is they are questioning the role. They are rethinking about what is it that we want to achieve and what are then the best rules and regulations to have, simple mm-hmm. rules and regulations. And I know for a fact, a super unbossed company here in Belgium that also had the rule, guys, we want you three days here in the office. And I know 100% sure this is not driven by control. It's simply because they created a culture which depends on physical contact. It's super important for them. It's a unique selling point even towards the people that they recruit. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in the example of Thomas, they pay the consequence that they will never work with someone who lives 10,000 kilometers away. Yeah. And that's just the consequence of this, but they are super (laughs) embossed and they believe the rule, the best rule to have about this uh, topic is that people have to be in the office, not out of control reasons, but just purely physical contact three days uh, a week. And so that's what I see a lot. I don't see a lot of managers, and I agree with Thomas, it's a red flag when they say, oh, you must come because we want to control you back. But what it triggered is the process of an embossing. And that's what I want listeners to really get. It's questioning the rules that used to be there and seeing with everybody whether we can come up with new things that better support the things we are trying to achieve. Good. Um, Let me put something on the table. It's a big topic, but... I, I think it. I think I really like an opportunity to think it through with you. Um, in my mind, that uh, the unbossing is a recognition that an autocratic boss or an autocratic hierarchy is counterproductive and also very unpleasant for the people who are further down in that uh, pyramid. Mm-hmm. A union is a, is another response to that. It's an attempt to sort of check the power of the autocrats. And, and so it has something in common. I'm not saying it, 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 is, it is another reaction to autocratic rule. What's very different about it is it creates a circumstance where you definitely have bosses and you definitely have people being bossed, but there's a, there's a codification of that relationship. How could like let's say a company with a union or several unions comes to Highfluence and says, we want to adopt some of the unbossing strategies. How would you, how would you sort of loosen the organization to allow that to happen? You mean when a union would come to us? Well, it would probably be the management of the unionized organization. Mm -hmm. That would be a dream. And I'll, I'll explain why I think that's a dream. Um, Coming from Europe, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, grateful for the work that unions have done in the beginning of the previous century. I think their impact on working conditions um, in the previous century were enormous, right? 
Um, the problem is that union organizations kind of face the same symptom as uh, typical corporate organizations. As they are also structured in an autocratic way, the power of a union is also centralized. And what you notice, whether in a union organization or a corporate organization, is when you centralize all the power with a few, tendency get that, well, it intoxicates, right? It corrupts. And so um, I often make the reflection, it's the first time I speak, I, I say it out loud, that unbossing movement is kind of the, the union of the 21st century, the union movement of the 21st century. We look at employee engagement numbers, burnout numbers, and we are seeing that trying to make the best possible workplace for the worker, that's a goal that unions are no longer um, achieving. Why? I believe it's also because they have to function in the same system as the corporate organization. And it's the system of the corporate organizations that results in those bad employee engagement numbers. So if a union organization would come to us, the first thing we would say is, let's start with embossing you guys. And then from that perspective, try to look at the organization. I, wow. The idea that a union organization would look at the world and at organizations in an embossed way. That's uh, that would be a dream come true, Tim. <laughs> it it would be it it would sort of almost be like uh, uh, nuclear disarmament, because mm. you have you have two parties that are that are that are basically as you pointed out. I di I didn't really think of this, but the union is a consolidation of power, usually under one person with an organizational structure. It's a counterweight to that same structure in the corporation, and you're mm -hmm. saying let's let's both disarm mm -hmm. um yep how would you I, I who would you think would be harder to sell on that do you think it would be the ceo or the president of the union it's i uh, <laughs> is there a, uh, the question i'm asking is, is there is there a difference huh? um um so i i i it, it I think it would be if, uh, assuming that they're both traditional conventional leaders, mm -hmm. they would be both equally um, equally difficult to approach. The more that their consciousness or their awareness of how the world is changing and how as a result of that uh, organizations are changing is, is growing, the easier it will become for them. Thomas, I see you uh, would like to add something. No, I was just thinking of uh, some union leaders um, who would wish that their unions are as hierarchical and bossed as you <laughs> were just describing them, guys. <laughs> that they would be the bosses and the rulers uh, also of the rebel fractions, uh, uh, over there, deep in the Black Forest, and also there in uh, in Belgium, uh, uh, in the in the Liège area. Uh, often, it's not the case, but I do think is that the fact that, for example, in Germany, uh, I guess you both know that unions are members of the board of directors mm -hmm. by law. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are sitting there, and and that is the, the case since 1976. Um, used to be, and I think still is, a competitive advantage mm -hmm. uh, 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 for Germany yep. uh, compared to other countries. Um, and it certainly, yeah, Tim, what you say, it goes in the direction uh, of unbossing. But then when you have this, it's the same like with the silos for me, you know, and the tribes. We are the union tribe. And we are sitting here as the representatives of our tribe. And this here is not a company, it's the United Nations Full Assembly. <laughs> and I have to be very careful on what the other guy on the other side of the table when they are trying to play tricks on me. Because I'm responsible for my tribe. Mm -hmm. And so this is now, of course, I'm making a caricature out of it, but you get my point. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Thomas, I, I'd like to add one more thing to the question more concrete, like how would you approach it? I think one of the biggest differences, Tim, between a bureaucratic organization and unbossed organization is the employer-employee paradigm disappears. Right. And, and the entire design of the organization is also driven by what does it mean to work as partners? Mm-hmm. And one partner can have more impact on the purpose or the value of the organization as someone else right? There can be a hierarchy of impact. There can be a hierarchy on who comes up with the best ideas, but um, within a hierarchy where everybody is uh, equal as partners. And so if, if sitting together with the CEO and the union leader, I think that is the door by which you need to enter the discussion. Mm-hmm. You know, can we make them step away from the paradigm, the contradiction between the employer as the and the employee as two opposite parties who in the end are competitors of each other? And how, what would it mean to evolve into a partner-partner relationship? And if you can achieve that at the level of the corporate leader and the union leader, that they truly become partners... Mm-hmm. then you plant the seed for everyone in the organization to become partners. That would be, a, 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 I think, a challenging, exciting, daunting uh, <laughs> task. Mm. Uh, that, would, that would be very interesting to see. Um, what technologies make flattening organizations work better? And let me sort of, sort of give you an example of why I ask this question. Um, a lot of organizations have platforms where, um, you know, an unlimited number of participants can engage with the platform and, and contribute to the outcome of the organization without even feeling like they have any boss at all. That has pros and cons, I'm sure. You know, it takes some of the humanity out of it and, and makes us into widgets, you know, cogs on a machine potentially. But the flip side is that the example that Joe Justice brought up when he was talking about Tesla and having screens and applications on our phones that would alert us to where the pain points were in the organization and allow us to spontaneously understand where we need to apply our intellect that was a big advantage that he he put forward that Tesla has this this almost collective awareness of where the problems are and how to how to deal with them. That's a technology, right? Emails technology, Slack is technology, instant messaging is technology. Where do you think the most fruitful efforts are in terms of applying technology to flattening organization and organization are? I'll start with Nick. Again. Uh, Tim, uh, next time we'll schedule uh, a, a one-day podcast so that <laughs> <laughs> I, I can share with you all my ideas and views on your questions. Um, but now I have to cherry pick one. Okay. And um, unbossing is in many ways finding rules and regulations that really give power to everyone in the organization to have an impact, Right. And let me link that philosophy to the technology question. What if every person in the organization, no, let me rephrase it. What if it would be so easy to develop software, to develop digital applications that solve a problem that you don't need software developers to do it? Mm-hmm. that you give the power that software has, you know, software technology is immensely powerful. The problem is that leveraging that power, you need software developers. So what if tomorrow everybody would be a software developer? Mm-hmm. That it would be so easy that whether you will live in this, work in the sales or as a sales role or you take up a product designer or whatever it is, you can you notice a pain point in your organization and you can build a digital solution for it. Um, I think that is where the radical innovation of technology linked to a decentralized way of working really lies. 
that is where you really give the power of software development, technology development to everyone in the organization and not just the IT department. Okay. Thank you. Thomas, do you want to add to that? Yeah, <laughs> look, for me, the ultimate key uh, to answer that question, because, uh, Tim, uh, these collaboration tools where everybody can bring in his or her ideas, uh, I saw them popping up 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, 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 it's for me now not, not the newest thing on earth. And what I have also seen over the last, now, say, 15 years is, you very often nobody uses it and that brings me back to the fascinating idea of of nick where he says everybody can be um a developer and it it, it links for me with yeah ease of use which means I, I i okay i don't love to use it in that way uh, so what would I love, right? Is that what you're saying? And that yep. that I would love, okay, do it. Do it right now. Is that what mm -hmm. you mean, Nick? Yeah, but also, so I, if, you, if, if I give a, a less, um, an answer that would be less out there than the one I gave <laughs> um, uh, is, okay, I don't see a successful company today not having an open innovation platform. Mm -hmm. Right. For example, you know, not having um, an, a platform where they co-create uh, services, co-create products with e external experts, um, external customers and so on. So that would be a technology right in there. With regards to technology that supports the actual decentralized way of working like Hola Spirit, um, GlassFrog, um, you have many, several technologies there. Um I've seen very successful cases and uh, less successful cases. And again, I come back to the fact that unbossing, it's the people facing the problem that have to come up with a solution. If you impose holacracy, uh, hola spirit or glass rock on organization, the tendency not to be accepted by the population is huge. However, if through a and, process and, and of... Nick, and just yeah. a second, yeah, because very often... And that can also happen. This technology thing is being directly connected to the unbossing journey, to the transformation uh, mm -hmm. journey, which could which could give a very bad vibe from the beginning. Yeah, just to say yeah. it back to you. So yeah. Um, uh, however, if you co create, if you co identify a problem that uh, together, and then. Um, you come up with the idea, ah, Hola Spirit or Glassfrog could solve this. I think you 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 um, you get better acceptance uh, ratios. And why not apply that mindset to any technology in the organization, right? Rather than imposing it. Yes. You know, yeah. like, not a solution um, looking for a problem, but a problem that yeah. you look for a solution to. Yeah. yeah. Which which is yeah yeah. Which let me, let me, I, you guys have been very generous uh, and we're coming up to the end of our time. This has been a terrific conversation. I want to ask a couple of questions about Highfluence itself. So when a company engages Highfluence, what is it hoping to achieve? What, is, what are the banner motivations that people come with? Well, <laughs> the, the, the people we work, uh, we are at our best with are leaders that are aware of all the pain points we discussed in this conversation. They know the bureaucratic organization is no longer fit for the market of today. They see it in the, the fact that they have difficulties hiring talent. They see it in the uh, employee engagement um, numbers. They see it in the difficulty they have with innov innovation. So, and they are aware, they also feel the intrinsic motivation to control less. You know, they, 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 they got to the top and it's kind of empty there, right? And so they, 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 they already have decided in their heads, I'm going to radically change how we work. I just don't know how to do it. What, is, what are the best practices? Where do I start? What, what kind of questions do I have to think about as a leader? Um, what's the time frame I'm looking at? Who, who do I involve first? 
Um, what after the first experiments, when you go from experimentation to standardization, right? And um, I think those are the people we connect best with because we understand where they're coming from. And we come with kind of um, yeah, a mixture of provocation and love, <laughs> which very works good. very well. Typically, Thomas is the provocateur, and I'm the I come with <laughs> lots of love. <laughs> All right, so Thomas, give us a little taste of prov provocation. Yeah, I can give it to you immediately, and uh, I can uh, put all the two of you out of your dreams. Um, <laughs> the reason why they are coming to us is the war for talent, which they are using, losing. Sorry. The reason they are coming to us, and again, I'm provocative now, I know, is that HR is telling them it's a disaster. The applications which we got in um, uh, during the last two months, it's not what we need. And by the way, there are five other highly talented people who uh, informed me the last two weeks that they will be leaving. So again, I'm putting it a bit into the extreme and it's certainly not 100% uh, true in every case of what we are talking about. But if you really ask me what's the driver today is for the big ones, it's this. So my last question, gentlemen, and again, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I'm curious how Highfluence itself is organized. How do you apply unbossing to an organization of people who are fans of unbossing. You are constantly at the edge of innovation in terms of unbossing. So um, you could say we have two purposes. On the one hand, it's uh, unbossing as many corporate organizations and leaders as we can because we see the positive impacts of that. And secondly, what does reinventing cons a consulting company mean, right? What are the classical bureaucratic rules and regulations of a consulting company? Um, for example, and consultants listening will know this, you have to enter your timesheets because in timesheets, uh, people can control, but also invoices can be created. Mm -hmm. um, and like this, there are many other rules and regulations which are typical for the bureaucratic consultancy company. And so how does unbossing look like in a company with unbossers, you are just constantly questioning the rules and regulations that we have been conditioned to as consultants coming from big consulting companies, some of us at least, and what is then a better alternative? And um, getting rid of the rule that you have to fill in timesheets and finding an alternative is, was, was one of the most freeing uh, experiences of my uh, uh, consultancy life. <laughs> I'm confident that's true. <laughs> I can imagine Nick, that. Nick is still thankful to me for that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah indeed. indeed. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, also, it's, it's no different, actually, than in any other company. It's really questioning everything what we do against what do we want to achieve, right? And um, yeah, constantly eliminating rules and regulations or rituals or whatever and coming up with new ones and what works stays and what doesn't work goes away. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Thomas, any last words on that uh, subject? What, what, what is unbossing like for you? Yeah, as a, a, again, uh, talking about this organizational model and it is so important what Nick said because look, the least credible thing you will ever see on this world is a totally conservatively organized consulting company <laughs> which is using PowerPoint slides. Sorry, Microsoft, that I have to use this PowerPoint picture the whole time. Uh, it could also be something else, which is with, in very traditional and boring methods telling you how they will bring you into the next century. It's ridiculous. And therefore, what Nick said is so important. We have to constantly be on the edge of innovation in terms of how we organize ourselves. That's one thing. But also the methods we use with the clients on the unbossing journeys themselves. So we don't have to, uh, you know, 
being blind for what about us. And that is for me the most important uh, uh, mindset and Nick described it wonderfully. Mm -hmm. Nick and Thomas, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you, and Tim. again, thanks to Joe Justice for, 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 for all the inspiration, for having to learn to know uh, uh, Tim. Yeah. And yeah, much yeah and feel, to you. feel free to schedule part two and part three because absolutely uh, I, I will we're, we're only touching the surface here i agree hey and the other way around the other way around guys yeah tim you should come on our podcast too I, yeah, i'd absolutely. be honored thank you gentlemen my guests today were thomas hubbock and nick van langendonk links to their linkedin profiles and the high fluence website and the unbossing podcast will be in the show notes my name is tim hampton and you can reach me at tim at unusuallywellinformed.com. Thanks for listening. I hope you will subscribe and join me for the next show with another unusually well-informed leader in business and technology. Thank you for listening to the Unusually Well-Informed podcast. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on the Unusually Well-Informed podcast are their own and do not reflect that of their employer or any other affiliation.